We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Aaron Gupta. Aaron Gupta is co-founder of the Independent, I-N-D-Y Pendant, and the Occupied Wall Street Journal, and former international news editor of The Guardian Newsweekly. He has visited more than 40 occupations in 27 states, covering the Occupy Wall Street movement nationwide for The Guardian, Al Jazeera, Salon, Truthout, The Progressive, The Nation, and other publications. And he is a regular commentator on Democracy Now! and the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and Al Jazeera. Arn, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Great to be with you today. So uh, tell us, how did you come about uh, your covering of the Occupy movement? What motivated you to start that? Uh, one simply was in my backyard. I live in Manhattan, uh, downtown Manhattan, and so it's uh, just a quick bike ride from where I live. But more important, uh, I've been interested in covering social movements for a long time because I think uh, any any sort of analysis shows that's where change really comes from. Positive change in our society uh, occurs from social movements. And uh, there's been a lot of unrest over the years uh, t in terms of uh, globally and also somewhat uh, in the United States in, in response to the political and social conditions. And, and particularly what I'm talking about is the economic depression we're in. By all standards, we are in a depression. The real unemployment rate is about 15 to 18 percent, where actually uh, this December will be the sixth year of this economic downturn. There's absolutely um, no uh, real hope in sight uh, of ending it, and it's probably just going to get worse given the policies uh, that both parties are enacting. And so I try to find and look for kind of those hints, those stirrings of, of movements uh, that are really bringing together a broad group of people um, under one banner, under an idea, and can affect uh, profound social change. And in terms of the Occupy movement in New York, there had been a lot of ferment uh, going on. There had been uh, a lot of mass marches in the sp spring of 2011. Uh, there was one that was uh, well over tens of well over 10,000 uh, students, labor, community groups, and they were trying to do something different. Uh, this is back in May. In terms of just having a march, uh, they were doing teach outs in the Wall Street area. Then in June, there was this three week encampment. In, uh, near City Hall called Bloombergville uh, that was inspired uh, by students and uh, community groups. Uh, and they were basically going after the budget cuts. There were also some other attempts uh, to occupy over the summer. So if we actually go back and look at the history of uh, the Occupy movement just in New York City, um, there was a lot going on in, in 2011. And, and of course, finally, this uh, spark turned into really just a, a raging fire ac across the country. I knew about the pre-organizing. Uh, I'd known about uh, the uh, call out from uh, ad busters uh, for, you know, p uh, people to, you know, it was like uh, bring tents and uh, uh, and uh, the question is, I think, is like, what, what is our one demand? Um, so, but in interestingly, now I, I cover a lot of economic issues, and uh, there's this website, this financial news website called Market Watch that I, I read every day, and I was seeing most of the coverage I was seeing outside of the alternative press was coming from this financial news website, uh, and it's actually owned by the News Corporation, and they had uh, some columnists who were really spe speaking favorably of Occupy Wall Street, why it was needed, why it was important. And it was actually really quite bizarre uh, to be finding uh, this on a financial news website, whereas, of course, the corporate media otherwise, the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, whatever, were not uh, touching it with a 100-foot pole. Um, and so I, I had heard plenty about it, and I decided to go down there on September 17th. I, w I was skeptical, uh, but at the same time, over the years, I've learned to be skeptical of my own skepticism, uh, partly because of uh, uh, Seattle uh, and the World Trade Organization uh, ministerial in uh, 1999. Uh, that completely came out of left field. I knew about the organizing there as well. I, I didn't come out for it. Um, but the fact that it turned into such a dramatic event and that uh, the protests shut it down 
was it was really a, a remarkable breath of fresh air. And so even though I was somewhat skeptical of uh, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement, because the organizing, to me, um, from what I understood, seemed the pre-organizing seemed really amorphous. Um, the decision-making structure seemed to be, you know, it was, it was kind of uh, too loosey-goosey. Still, I was like, you know, let me go down there and see what happens. And I went down there. It felt different. Um, you know, it felt like, okay, this is not the usual protest. Uh, and, and and as it turned out, it wasn't. And I started uh, going down almost every day and just watched it uh, grow and develop. Uh, the first day was very interesting uh, because I did see uh, a fair number of people I know who are politically active uh, in, in New York, uh, you know, what I term the usual suspects, but in a good way. These are people who really spend their lives in the, in the trenches doing the hard work of uh, political organizing. Uh, as I walked around uh, Zuccotti Park that night, I was just striking up random conversations, and I was meeting people from a across the country, Connecticut, Austin, Texas, the, the Bay Area, Portland. And again, one of the things that struck me was I actually met very few people uh, from New York City, at least uh, new people. And some of the people I talked to had come fr from across the country. They couldn't even really explain why they were there. And the the closest uh, analogy I could uh, it it's really struck me. It was like uh, close encounters of the third kind. Richard Dreyfuss's character and all those other characters who are just drawn to this mysterious force, and they don't know what motivates them. And, and that's how people were were talking. They would ha get this wide eyed look and kind of you know, turn their head and stare into the distance and just like, I know I had to be here. You know, and they couldn't articulate exactly why they were here. But nonetheless, I was just like, OK, this is interesting that all these people from across the country have been attracted to it. And so, of course, it just grew into something really amazing and, and profound over uh, the few weeks. And uh, my partner, Michelle Fawcett, and, and I thought, like, this is literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because by early October, you know, reports were that these encampments were just springing up across the country. And even in our, our digital uh, wired age, uh, I'm a big believer and you have to be on the ground and see how things are developing. So we're like, let's hit the road. Uh, let's go and uh, go from uh, occupation to occupation. So in the fall, we uh, basically drove across the country, uh, hit about uh, 30 occupations uh, during this period. Um, and uh, while we were driving across, it took, it took a, we were on the road for almost three months and uh, we saw it rise and then started to see many of them fall because uh, by November, of course, you started to get the whole wave of ev evictions and uh, uh, attacks on uh, the encampment. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a, a just a really, um, I'd say a life-changing experience, being able to meet all these people uh, and to see just the phenomenal uh, diversity of the movement. This is, I think, really one of the most diverse movements in U.S. Uh, history uh, in terms of the different classes it's, it's drawn from, the different attitudes, the different social groups, racial groups, ethnic groups, you know, people's position in society. It really just motivated so many people uh, throughout society and across a political spectrum to identify with it. So how does this movement compare with other movements that you've uh, observed over the years? Um, there's this interesting phenomenon, I think, and, and I'm talking more about the left. I've also studied the Tea Party movement uh, a good bit. I've gone to Tea Party movement meetings. And um, I think it's uh, foolish to dismiss the Tea Party as a, a astroturf movement. It's very much a, a real movement. Now, of course, they're, they're just kind of doing the bidding of the corporate elite, but nonetheless, these people really believe it. And the other part of it is, it's why is it so hard to believe? A, a lot of progressives and leftists are always running around talking about how racist America is. And so it's like, okay, you believe this country is 
totally racist, but then why is it so hard to believe that you have this essentially racist movement, the Tea Party movement? And it is fundamentally racist. It's it's a movement of um, older white uh, conservative Americans who want to uh, essentially punish uh, anyone they see as undeserving, and they use coded language in that in terms of uh, immigrants, uh, what, you know, which is refers to Latinos, people on welfare, which is coding for African Americans, and and yet they have absolutely no problem with the home interest mortgage deduction, uh, which if you actually look at the subsidy there, that is greater than all social programs combined apart from uh, Medicare or, or rather Medicaid. Um, you know, the the ability to deduct uh, the interest uh, from your taxes on, on your mortgage. And who's that betting, uh, benefiting? It's largely benefiting the white middle class. And so if you're really serious about cutting uh, the budget deficit, you would demand that this would be cut, first of all. Um, but... If we look at, uh, I think, recent history, and by that I'm I'm referring to post-World War II U.S. history, this is really the first mass movement that puts class back on the agenda. Um, You know, the we are the 99%, the the target of Wall Street, uh, the slogan the 1%, which of course has been completely co-opted by liberal groups and uh, is uh, kind of stealthily being used by Obama. Um, As as an aside, uh, uh, even as uh, the government is attacking the Occupy movement, uh, they've uh, framed uh, basically these uh, hapless kids uh, both in Chicago and Cleveland on uh, who are affiliated with the Occupy movement on terror, terrorism charges. So even as Obama's FBI is uh, trying to attack and destroy the movement uh, back up to its dirty uh, cointel tr- Pro tricks. It's uh, Obama is using Occupy language in trying to win re-election. Um, I mean, he would ha- be having no traction against Romney in terms of trying to paint him as this uh, wealthy elitist who outsources j- jobs, is out of touch with average Americans, who's hiding uh, all his wealth in, uh, overseas. All of this comes from the Occupy movement and the anger that it crystallized ag- against the concentration of uh, economic and political power in this country. Now, in terms of how Occupy relates to other uh, social movements, um, like I said, it, the diversity, I think, is is really remarkable. The anti-war movement, the anti-Iraq war movement, um, you know, that was, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, somewhat partisan uh, or very partisan because, um, and, you know, unfortunately, we, we've seen that partisanship cut both ways, right? So I think you did get a lot of independents who were against uh, the Iraq war, but really it was it was kind of um, the Democrats uh, and liberals who provided uh, the bulk of people who would come out to the really big demonstrations. Um, like any s- social movement of significance over the last 50 years, it was organized by the left. Uh, but uh, the uh, huge marches, of, you know, of February 15th, 2003, um, the one following Cindy Sheehan's encampment in September of 2005, um, all the various other demonstrations in uh, the first part of 2003, you, you were only getting hundreds of thousands of people coming out if, if you were kind of getting um, liberals and independents coming out. You know, this was not something that was uh, um, really opposed uh, by Republicans. Now, the Occupy movement, as we went across the country, we were encountering in a lot of places self-identified conservatives. Uh, we stopped being surprised, you know, by the time we got to, I, I think, like uh, Mobile, Alabama. It's just like, okay, they're they're part of uh, the movement everywhere. Tons of uh, military veterans, of, of course, labor. Um, you would get a lot of uh, Ron Paul types, a lot of the uh, and the Fed folks, uh, libertarians. 
Um, I, you know, it was, it was really across the political spectrum. And that's both great and problematic at the same time because it becomes very hard then to articulate uh, a position uh, beyond opposition. You know, h- how do you say what you're actually for if you have uh, opinions ranging from conservative and libertarian to anarchist and, and socialist? Uh, you're going to get people at each other's throats. Um, the the one area I think that uh, was very problem has been uh, problematic for the Occupy movement in terms of its social composition is around race. Um, it varied greatly a- across the country. Uh, some cities, uh, uh, and one of the interesting things about it is it's very much an urban movement. Um, you know, it's it's just like of course you would have Occupy movements in small towns, but it's not really a, a rural phenomena. Um, but I think one of the re- things that uh, deeply motivated it is th- it showed us that uh, we lack any sort of common public space, any sort of democratic commons in this country. It's it's been completely colonized by uh, corporations. You know, you can go into any city. Seattle is is a perfect example. You know, why are you in downtown? You're in downtown to consume. Uh, it's it's not a space for actually vibrant uh, public life. If there if there is any sort of uh, public life, it's commodified. It's it's a cultural festival. It's a music festival, and you have to pay admission. Um, and the thing about Occupy, I would stand on the steps of Zuccotti Park often, and it was uh, kind of the. Um, eastern edge of it was elevated and you could stand up there and and look down uh, on everything below. And I would just really stand there and watch as hundreds of people would engage in all these exchanges and they're exchanging bedding, they're exchanging clothing, uh, there's food being given out, there's a library, health care, counseling, arts, uh, music, and just all this exchange, and none of it was mediated by money. Of course, you know, the goods were donated, so um, uh, there's money at some point. But in terms of that space itself, there was no exchange of money whatsoever. And it was just really stunning and, and really refreshing because you felt like you could breathe again. It's like, wow, there is a different type of society uh, that that is really possible. That isn't j- just about like, you know, I want to buy this for that much, you know. And uh, I think that's why it, it really captured people's uh, imaginations, that it, it showed them physically that we can live in a different world, that we don't need corporations, we, we don't need the state, we don't need the mainstream media, we certainly don't need the war on terror and and the police state uh, that we live under. It was a rejection um, of everything in, in of our governing apparatus, and that really uh, frightened the government. And and so, you know, this is, I think, a very different experience uh, politically, socially, than uh, what we've been used to in, in this country, a very different um, type of movement. Um, and, you know, over time, it, it uh, started, the contradictions uh, started to really surface uh, that, you know, that the occupations in a lot of cities became an end in and of themselves, um, you know, that it, the decision-making uh, structure, these general assemblies, it's, you know, it's it's a nice ideal, but how how functional is it to have a general assembly of 500 people or even uh, much less, you know, 5,000 people or 50,000 people? There's, there's no way um, that you're going to be able to come to any uh, sort of uh, agreement or real discussion because there's no way everyone can have their say beyond, you know, it, maybe if it's like, you know, 50 or 100 people, that's probably the outer limits where, where you can have a, a genuine uh, democratic uh, forum in terms of the way it's set up. And so people weren't able to deal with the issue of a, a representative democracy um, in any form. And, you know, because I think there's this kind of knee-jerk uh, 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 hatred or, or at least contempt of it uh, in our society because, you know, 
we have a representative democracy and look how disastrous it's turned out. Um, but more, I think the problem is, is, you know, do people really have uh, control over this this system? In, in any case, though, I, I think it's uh, really been uh, remarkable uh, for showing what are the possibilities that we can live in a, a very different uh, type of society um, that isn't all about uh, commodification, commodifying our labor, commodifying our housing, our health care, our education uh, for the interests of, of private corporations. But together, people really can, I think, uh, decide their lives a lot better than the supposed experts we have to listen to. Well, speaking of uh, supposed representative democracy, we uh, have a major presidential election coming up here. We've got the RNC happening this next week. Um, one of the things, in, uh, with rare exceptions, that the Occupy movement doesn't appear to have been engaged with is the electoral system. Seattle, here in Seattle, we have, you know, I think one candidate that's from <clears throat> Occupy that's running at the state level. Um, do you see that as something that people should be getting engaged in? And what do you see as the value of uh, like third parties that are running uh, in the president, presidential election? I, I think, you know, Martin Luther King uh, said that he was neither Democrat or, or, or Republican. And he said that for a very good reason, that he was interested in uh, changing something deeper rather than, you know, who's who's the cast in, in Washington. And, it, and here's the thing. Elections are about moving a candidate or at most a party. Movements move the whole system. Uh, and Occupy, it really, it um, reshaped the debate in a, in a matter of weeks. You know, before Occupy, was anyone even talking about the 1% or the, the 99%? This wasn't even part of political discourse, and now it's become a standard part of political discourse, and, and, and everybody knows uh, what it is. And Obama is very much running uh, an Occupy Wall Street campaign, even as, the, as they're using... Um, uh, Democrats, you know, are responsible because who's in charge of the cities? It tends to be Democratic mayors. You know, they're the ones who are attacking the Occupy movement. We know they've been coordinating with Homeland Security. The FBI is uh, uh, ginning up these uh, entrapment plots in Cleveland and Chicago. And yet the way he's going after Romney, you know, this guy is a wealthy elitist who wants to outsource jobs and doesn't care about average Americans. Uh, he's hiding uh, all his money in, you know, these uh, shady overseas tax havens. He's basically saying everything, but, you know, he is the 1%. And then if you look at uh, the... Uh, Groups who are doing the grunt work for the Obama campaign, uh, move on, rebuild the dream, organize labor. They're constantly talking about this isn't a, you know this is about the ninety nine percent versus the one percent. They've been calling Mitt Romney Mister One Percent uh, since uh, last year. They, they've been uh, actually trying to co opt um, the Occupy movement, um, uh, rebuild the dream, move on, and uh, SEIU essentially created. Um, this uh, f uh, new movement called the 99% movement and uh, to try and coast um, on the energy of uh, the Occupy movement and uh, take it and, and turn it in, into elections. And I, I don't have a problem with, with people, you know, if they want to go out um, and vote for Obama. You know, this seems to be a, a this is a debate every four years, you know, between like, oh, you know, the Democrats are so horrible. And they, of course, they are horrible. You know, it's like we're, we are now in six or seven different wars uh, because of this administration. Uh, Obama has done stuff Bush and Cheney never dreamed of. This is he is asserting the right to extrajudicial and assassination of American citizens and and carrying it out. Uh, the U.S. is still doing extraordinary renditions, still still engaging in torture, massive uh, spying on on the domestic front. Um, absolutely uh, no progress on global warming, or actually there's progress. It's it's getting worse. Um, you know, he endorses uh, fracking. Uh, they're going to open up the Arctic Ocean. Uh, to, uh, they already are opening up the Arctic Ocean to oil exploration. Uh, he's made an absolute mess of the mortgage uh, crisis, actually made it 
uh, far worse uh, with his policies. Uh, they've basically kicked labor uh, right in the face, uh, attacking uh, teachers' unions, uh, attacking the United Auto Workers, uh, doing absolutely nothing to get uh, any even mildly reformist legislation passed to help uh, labor, labor organizing. And you can go on and on and on and on. And Obama is really the third Bush term. But nonetheless, the Republicans are even scarier. You know, what, what I would argue is that we need to have a, a more sophisticated uh, understanding. What the Democrats do is they take uh, right-wing extremism and turn it into uh, bipartisan consensus, such as with the war on terror. Um, and then, so what that means is the next iteration of, of the Republican Party gets more extreme. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, Romney and Ryan uh, would be really scary. They will really try and do away with Social Security and uh, Medicare, in my opinion. But of course, Obama has endorsed that from from day one. Um, a couple of weeks before his inauguration, he called for entitlement reform, which is nothing but code word for cuts to Social Security and, and Medicare. You know, and there's also this phenomenon of, uh, you know, Nixon going to China. The idea is like only this uh, uh, really a uh, gung-ho warmonger could uh, go to China, uh, only Clinton could add, end welfare. You know, the Republicans could never end welfare. It could only take Clinton. Similarly, only the Democrats uh, can end Social Security and, and Medicare. You know, and Obama has endorsed the whole austerity ideology, even though it's stupid from this uh, simplest economic economic standpoint. We're repeating the mistakes of the Great Depression all over again. If you want a more recent example, look at what's going on in Europe. They're uh, enforcing austerity policies, and it, it's just been an utter chaos and, and horrifying what's happening to countries like Greece and, and Spain and Ireland and, and Portugal. And yet this is the policies that Obama endorsed. So I think we do need more sophisticated understanding. We need to put energy into independent movement building. I'm not a big fan either of third parties because the field is just so tilted in favor of, of corporate interests. I mean, you know, you can run third party. The argument is, well, you run third party candidates for education to show people that there are different ideas. And sure, that's fine. But um, in terms of actually trying to um, get people elected who are fundamentally different, it it virtually never happens. Um, and secondly, even if it does happen, they're so constrained by other forces uh, because the way that uh, corporations control the media, they control the lobbying process, that once they get into power, they become captive to all those interests. The, the notion of pouring all this energy into elections uh, is based on this uh, f uh, false assumption that it's a level playing field, when of course it's not. Only about uh, a minute and a half. So what's the solution? Where should people be pouring their energy into? Well, I, I think independent movement building. You know, it's... it's so Occupy has, uh, you know, I don't want to minimize uh, the state repression. It's It's been really uh, severe. The fact that we see, you know, just these stormtroopers uh, attacking uh, the movement uh all across the country, what happened in in the fall and winter is is and there was really little um, outcry. Uh, there's popular outcry, but there's you know none in Congress, none among politicians, certainly not in in the media. That attacking peaceful people, <clears throat> just expressing their uh, their dissent, um, is 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 really stunning, and so. But there are also, I think, a lot of internal problems in the movement, you know, having to do, deal with the decision making and, you know, this type of uh, um, uh, love of the ultra democratic form um, and, you know, a, a lack of focus and strategic thinking. Uh, but the social conditions are going to get worse. Now, I'm not one of these people who thinks it has to get worse before it gets better, but objectively, it is going to get worse. Um, the economy is, is going to get worse. Environmental uh, conditions are, are going to get worse. There's going to be more job outsourcing, more cutting of uh, benefits, 
Um, you know, the number of homelessness in this country is absolutely staggering. Uh, something like 10 percent of households are doubled up in this country. And technically, those people are homeless. You know, you don't have to be on the streets. But if you've had to move your family into, you know, your your brother's house and now you have two families under one roof, I mean, that creates a lot of stress. So there will be more social outbursts. You know, the question is how, how they're, sh- they're shaped and how how um, they really attack uh, and go after the privileges and reshape our our society. And what I'm hoping is people learn, you know, what worked with the Occupy movement and more important, what didn't work with the Occupy movement and can have even more success next time. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thank you.